Thank you, Jesus. Believe in God to do a work in our hearts and lives. Amen. All right, let's go ahead and read right here. Um, Romans 6, we'll read verses 1 through 11. Amen. It says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead dies no more, death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once, but in that he lives, he lives unto God. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Father, we thank you for your word, Lord God. We pray that, Holy Spirit, that you would be with us tonight and that you would help that you would be the teacher, Lord, and that you would be the preacher, and that you would anoint the Word of God, and that you would anoint our ears to hear, and for our hearts to receive your truth, Lord God, because we know that your truth is anointed all by itself, Lord, and you said it to your disciples. You said you shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free, and so we pray and we thank you for your freedom tonight, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Praise God. So, you know, we've, we've already covered uh, 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 quite a bit, like going through um, chapter, w whenever I started this little series on Romans, and we talked about righteousness, and we went into Romans chapter 3, and then we went through 4 and 5, and the last time what we talked about was about the fact that where, where sin, where there was sin, that grace much more abounded. Where sin did abound, grace did much more abound, and I, and I tried to draw this little picture of, uh, well, let me see if I can, I might even, be able to, might even be able to pull it up. I thought that that was a cool little piece of artwork I did, but I don't know, maybe not. Um, I probably won't be able to do this like this, I'm sure. Let's see here. Let's find it. Is this it? No. This is, might be it. Right here. This one. That was it. And what I said was, because in the Greek language, the idea, at least one Greek scholar, made the comment that the sin, where sin did abound, grace did much more abound, that the idea was like if the sun was shining its rays on the earth, that there's more energy in the sun that it produces than what the earth is able to utilize. So much of the energy from the sun actually just continues on in space, and it's never even used. The point behind it is, is that where sin does abound, grace does much more or super abound. Like there's not enough sin to be able to exhaust the grace of God. And, you know, whenever the Apostle Paul is talking about some of that, he ends up going on to say, so what, shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound? And he says, God forbid. OK, it's not God's will for you and I to continue to sin, even though we so once we know that there's an overabundance of grace to deal with sin. See, many people were believing that he was teaching that, oh, well, then I'm just going to go on and keep sinning because there's more grace than there is sin. And so if I sin, then I'm going to get grace. And Paul said, no, that's not what we're even talking about here, because we also know from the word of God that God desires for his people to look different than the world around them. And so we cannot just live lives of sin uh, and, and expect that God's going to be okay with that. Amen? I mean, I was able to share with a woman today um, that, at a clinic today, and, um, and, and she, you know, she told me that she was Catholic, that she needed to get back into church, whatever the case. But, you know, one of the things that I, in, in the course of witnessing, I talked about the fact that God has always desired, because I said this, I said, look, hopefully you don't get offended by this, but I did it, I said it. I said, look, you know, 
God wants his people to look different than the world. And so this is always, always my go-to with Catholicism. Y'all ready? <laughs> God wants his people to look different than the world. So let's just use Mardi Gras as an example. And y'all, I don't know what y'all's position is on Mardi Gras, but that's what I'm using. You ought to not be going to Mardi Gras unless you're handing out tracts and telling people about Jesus. I'm just telling you, like, there ain't nothing holy about that. It's all a bunch of revelry. It's a bunch of wickedness, okay? And so we're not going to, we're in the world, but we're not of the world, right? And so anyway, I said, let's use Mardi Gras for an example, okay? When everybody, when I, because I said, I could talk about this because I was born and raised Catholic. Okay, and so when I was Catholic and I was doing the whole Mardi Gras thing, the whole, all of us out there were a bunch of revelers, a bunch of drinkers, a bunch of doing a bunch of no good, and we were all acting like it was perfectly normal and it was okay. And so the majority of people that are of that persuasion, or a lot of people, no, the majority of people that are of that persuasion, at least in this local area, believe that that is perfectly normal behavior because it's been endorsed by the church. All right, and so, but the problem is is this is that it it's a symptom that we're not really being separated out unto God is the point that is how I use that you might use different words but the way I use it is is that look God has always wanted his people to be different and the way that we know that is because in the Old Testament even with Abraham and it's kind of not weird it's the Bible but for younger minds and stuff like that it might seem weird the the circumcision God caused Abraham or told Abraham to be circumcised and he wanted his people to be circumcised and the reason why was that it made them different than the heathen nations that were around them i've made the comment many times in teaching before how do you think pharaoh's daughter knew that moses was a hebrew boy okay when you pull the covers off he looks it's different he's a hebrew boy it ain't it don't look like all these egyptian 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 spirit amen it's the cutting away of flesh through the shedding of blood, Jesus died, amen, on the cross, shed his blood so that you and I could be separated from our flesh. And the more we're separated from our flesh, the more we're separated from the world. And the more we're separated from the world, the more we begin to look like the Lord. And the more we begin to look like the Lord, there's a clear distinction between God's people and the world. Amen. I hope that that sounds right. That should sound right. And so God desires, no, he doesn't desire, he demands I said that to her. I said it wasn't a request. God demands that his people be different and separated. Now, the question is, how is that done in the New Testament? Amen. Because anybody in this church or anybody that would watch on video that says, oh, but I try, preacher, I try, and I get it. We've all been there. We've all tried, and we, and many, and we should continue to try. And, and, we, and, and, you know, we, we, we got to still wake up and we still got to, by the grace of God, make the right choices and go to the right places and ask God for the right things. I understand that. But, but it's not you trying in your own strength. You need to understand that. You can't overcome the power of sin in your own strength. And Lord, anybody in here that's walked with God for any length of time, if you open up the door to sin, you realize that no matter how fast you tried to close it, you wasn't able to close it as fast as what you want to. But I got good news for you that the Lord, amen, will give you victory if you desire to serve him and continue to call upon him. He will begin to reveal to you how this faith and grace works. Faith and grace. Amen. You know, that, that's the new covenant. Faith and grace. And where there is grace, there is peace. Amen. And I want you to know that this morning. So in Romans chapter 6, verse 3, he says, so shall we continue, in verse 2, he says, so shall we continue in sin so that grace may abound. He says, God forbid, and then he goes on to say, know ye not that so many of us, as, of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death. Now, we've already covered this verse, and I focused on baptism, and I made the point about transliteration. Y'all remember that when I wrote the Greek word up there, and then I turned it into an English word. And I told you that the definition was not necessarily the same. Uh, you know, a definition is different than just making a word out of another language. Not, we don't need to get into all that again. But that the definition of baptism itself doesn't mean water. 
We talked about that. That was a big concept. That baptism in the Greek language literally means to be immersed into something. So the beauty about water baptism is that it perfectly illustrates what really happened spiritually when you got saved. Because if you think about it, when you got set, when you got before you were saved, you were born of Adam, your first birth, and you were and you were living a life of sin. Even if you were a young person, you wasn't right. And the point is, is that you were dry and you were not right on the outside. Amen. But when you gave your heart to Jesus Christ, or when you gave your heart to God and you accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, the Bible teaches that the Holy Spirit came to live on the inside of you and a miracle took place where in the mind of God, the old man that you were died, he was buried, and then he resurrected to newness of life. So now imagine somebody that's being baptized in water. He's the old man. He goes down and he's dunked into the water. He's buried in the water, and then he's resurrected. Amen. In Christ to newness of life. But I need you to know that in, in this passage that we're talking about, water is not in the, in the original text. Okay. And that the meaning of the word itself is not describing water baptism, but that the meaning is describing that through faith, you and I are taken by the Holy Spirit and placed in Christ. We're baptized into him and we become one with him. Amen. Now, I like this, this phrase right here, know ye not. It's one word in the Greek, and it's the word agnaeo. And when Rob and I started the Bible study, that's what we called our, named our Bible study. We learned, I learned that word from, from Brother Larson. Oh, by the way, I texted him, and he got back with me, and he plans on, uh, you know, he's going to give me a date coming up. So that's good news. Praise God. But whenever, whenever, I, whenever I was learning from him, he would talk about this word agnaeo a lot. And, and it says right here, the, and the idea behind it, I'm about to break it down a little bit more here in a second, is were you ignorant of this? Now, you know, ignorance is not a bad word. I can always say that. I remember, you know, anyway, I'm not going to bring that up again. But ignorance, but if somebody tells you that you're ignorant and they got the wrong attitude when they tell you, it can be very irritating. You're just ignorant. Okay. But ignorance in and of itself, it just means you don't know something. And we all got to come to the realization that sometimes we don't know some things. And we got to be willing to learn. It's good to have a teachable spirit. Amen. Ignorance is different than, than dumb. <laughs> okay, if I can say it like that. Ignorance is you just don't know. But there's also another element to this word that it's not just ignorance. It can also be unwillingness or, in the definition, disinclination or being disinclined. Not wanting to. Okay, so either you didn't know or once you do know, you still don't want to go. Okay, does that make sense? And so, so did you not know that as many of us as were, can we just use different words, placed or immersed into Christ were also immersed or placed into his death? And so I, I went ahead and I added this little thing here. I'm not trying to cover up, know ye not, but I'm trying to make, make you aware that the meaning of the word, again, means either unaware or unwilling. Now, this is very profound, this concept of what we're talking about. Because what we're talking about now in this chapter 6 of Romans is how a person can walk in victory, spiritually speaking, what happens spiritually. You know, I was sharing with y'all the other day about that young lady that I was talking to about mental health and stuff. And she said, I finally understand what you're saying, but it's such an abstract thought. See, she had, to, she, and finally the Holy Spirit came in, and, and I got to tell you that this is an abstract spiritual thought. You cannot, you cannot just see it with your physical eyes. You, you and I need the Holy Spirit to give us a revelation or an understanding. And many times we, we think we can understand it in our mind, and we think we have it, but we need the Holy Spirit to give us a revelation. Because let me just tell you, when you get a revelation of the things that I'm going to try to talk to you about tonight, you're going to see something different in your thing 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 different Before we go, go too much further, and we're going to be moving towards Romans 7, and by the time it's all said and done, we're going to get at least through Romans 7, okay, before we move on. But what I want you to understand is this, is that whenever the Apostle Paul got saved, 
Okay, I want you to imagine, whenever you read your Bible, you need to try the best you can as you're learning and you're growing in your understanding of the Bible. You need to try to place yourself in that character's life, at that place where he was, and just to try to imagine. So the things that I know about Paul, I'm going to share with you a little bit. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. The Bible says that he was so proud about his Jewish ancestry and his Jewish lineage that that because he describes he said this is how I thought I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees he says I was from the tribe of Benjamin I was circumcised on the eighth day (laughs) he was saying a lot in other words he's saying I'm not some Johnny come lately my friend I'm not some proselyte that was some centurion dude that was really from from Rome and didn't have Jewish lineage no I'm from the tribe of Benjamin they got me present and accounted for they know where I come from I was circumcised on the eighth day just like Isaac not like Ishmael at 13 years old I, I no 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 I was circumcised I'm a Jew of the Jews okay and he said and you know what in the end he said and I count all that stuff as dumb only to know Jesus Christ. So, but, but listen, at the same time, when he says, I count it all dung, it's after he's received the revelation. Because we learn about the Apostle Paul and, and, and through the book of Acts and also in the, in the letter to the Galatians, that there was a time when he obviously was struggling in his newfound faith in Christ. He had a very dramatic a uh, very dramatic conversion on the road to Damascus. We, many of us have read that story and we're familiar with it. Very dramatic conversion, okay. But, but we can find in the scriptures that there was some period of time, some people say three years, seven years, some people even say ten years, of a struggle that ensued on the inside of him. A time frame when he was absent from the church. We don't know for sure because the book of Acts doesn't really give us specific chronology but there was a period of time that the apostle paul was introduced to the church and then he's not there for a while and then they call barnabas they say hey you need to go find saul of tarsus because we need his help go find him go hunt him down wherever he is well it's believed by many scholars and especially people that i that i respect that during this time frame however long it was paul was in the arabian desert and he was going through a spiritual struggle and we'll learn about that more when we get to Romans chapter 7. But what the spiritual struggle was, was that he kept reverting to his old way of believing how God ministers to people. Well, what, what did Paul know about God before his conversion? He knew the law, right? He knew the law of Moses. How do you know? He knew it better than anybody. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Listen, when you got saved, what's one of the first things? No, when you really got saved and you knew God had done something in your heart and in your life, I don't know about you. Let me not use you as an example. One of the first things I did was I called up my little sister, and I said, girl, you better quit messing around because, look, people that fornicate going to hell. And she said, well, you're going to be the first one to split the doors wide open, bruh. All right. And so, but what I'm trying to say is, is that I was already like within a week judging people. And I didn't realize that I was just really trying to help people. And I didn't know how to do it. I was, had become very self-righteous. And then next thing you know, I'm like, man. And so I start trying to do all of these works and all of this stuff and pray more and go to church more. And, all, and uh, listen, we already have made it clear. We do those things. But if we're doing those things and the motive behind it, It is us thinking that we're getting closer. Yes, you are getting closer to God. You got to choose your words right to get this stuff out. You are getting closer to God when you read the word because you're learning about Jesus. You are getting closer to God when you go to church because we're fellowshipping and we're learning about Jesus. When we pray, yes. But when our mindset is that by me doing these things, this is what pleases God. And yes, God is pleased when we pray and go to church and, and spend time in the word, amen, and fellowship with believers. Yes, he's pleased with all that, but that he, whenever Jesus was baptized in water, what happened? The voice from heaven spoke from heaven and said, this is my son. In him I am well pleased. And so what I need you to understand is this, is that if we're trying to, to be righteous in the eyes of God through the many things we do, we just messed it all up. We just took something beautiful, like being baptized in the Holy Spirit and praying in the Spirit, by fasting, fasting is something for the church. We, pro- we all need to really probably be fasting more, my friend. We really should. We all need to be praying more, 
Okay, but if you think you're going you're gonna to earn righteousness with God by fasting more, praying more, praying in tongues, reading your Bible more, going to church more, being involved in more ministries, you, my friend, have submitted yourself to a system of law. Is it the Mosaic law? Is it the law of Moses? No, it is not, but it's the similar concept. You perform, you get rewarded. You perform, you get rewarded. That's not how it works. Jesus. Jesus performed, you and I believe in Christ, and we get rewarded with grace that ministers to us, strengthens us, amen, and changes us. Praise God. That's the word of God. But you got to understand to begin with. And so whenever you first get saved, like I did, and you're told, well, you need to do these things, guess what? You start doing them, and before you know it, your faith is in what you do instead of what Christ did, and you don't even understand that the old man that was born died. No, really, like in the mind of God, let me just tell you what happened. God sees you and being one with Jesus and dying with him and being buried with him and a new man being resurrected. So if you're unaware of it, that means you're ignorant. Why would you be unaware of it? Why would you be ignorant? Anybody in this room that's been saved for any length of time, you, you did not hear the first thing about this probably until, until I know most of y'all, okay, until y'all either heard Brother Swagger talking about it or y'all stumbled into this church at one point in time. Because, because, they, because that's not what's being preached for the most part. That's not what's being preached. Because for the most part, what's being preached is a works-based message. Well, look, when I first got saved, I've watched the church change. I told that young lady that today also. I've watched the church change since I got saved when I was 19. I'm 55. I've been in this a little bit. When I first got saved, the message was, if you a sinner, you go into hell and you better quit sinning. And the way you quit sinning is you do this, 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 and this. It was a works-based message when I got saved. Then the transition was, well, you just got to confess yourself out of sin. You got to start to, you, you, you know, I re, you, you got to use the power that are in your words. And you got to speak these things into existence. Uh, and, and you can, and, and you know, and you can, you, and listen, there's power in the name of Jesus. You can rebuke the devil. Amen. In the name of Jesus, you can rebuke him. You can take authority over him. But if you start thinking that the object of your faith is you rebuking the devil. You don't put the ob- you don't put your faith in the in the something else that's like I'm praying more, going to church more. You understand the object of your faith is supposed to be Jesus Christ and what He did for you at the cross, Amen. And so we start doing all of these things, and so I saw that it started off as a works based message. You don't do this, and this is how you don't do that. And then you start confessing all this stuff. You're a little God, man. Just go ahead and that's what they teach. I'm not saying that. You're a little God. You just go ahead and you just confess it. You profess it. And look, there's, there's power, the power of life and death is in the tongue. Yes, it is. But you're taking it out of context. You're using it improperly. Now we live in the midst of a modern church that don't even want to talk about sin. They don't even want to talk about sin or the blood. They want to talk about the love of God, but it's a love that ain't the love of God that's in the Bible. Because God commendeth or shows his love towards us, and now while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. So that's what the Bible says love looks like. Amen? And, and so we've seen these changes take place. And, and this is what the, the church, this is the Bible. Did you not know that those of us that were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Were you unaware? Again, this is what started me down that rabbit trail. Why would you be unaware? Because they ain't teaching it, preacher. They're not teaching it. They're teaching a bunch of other stuff, but they're not teaching this. But this is the word of God. So if you need to understand why sometimes we struggle, you struggle. Hey, listen, that doesn't mean that it's all going to be perfect from this day moving forward once you get a revelation of this. That's not the point. But what's going what's to happen is you're going to start to learn the source of your victory. I hope that makes sense. You're going to know where to put your faith. Even if, God forbid, you as a Christian for 12 years open up the wrong door to sin, and you know you've been trying to kick the devil out, and he's like, oh, no, no, ma'am, no, sir, you invited me in, and I'm comfy on your couch, and I'm not going anywhere. Even if all of that, when the time is right, and you look, and you know where to look, you know 
know where to hope. You know where to put your faith. And you put your faith in Christ and you trust. Hallelujah. Guess what? The Lord will give you the victory. I believe that because he wants to. He wants to give you the victory. Why? Because he wants you to work with him in his kingdom. I'm telling you right now. I hope that sounds right to you. All right. So therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Isn't that good? So Jesus, listen, so we were, we were buried with, with Christ in this, in this spiritual baptism, right? We were buried in his, in, it, it, we died with him. And that just like Jesus was raised from the dead, the word of God says that, that we also should begin to walk in newness of life. Now, then what I need you to understand is this, that Jesus told, who was it? Was it Martha or Mary? I get it confused sometimes. He, she said, he says to her, she says, Jesus, if you would have been here just a little bit sooner, my brother would have raised from the dead. And he said, he will raise again. I believe it was Martha. I could be wrong. Just don't hold me accountable on that because it's an accident. Anyway, he says, he says, he will raise again. Yes, I know. He, she, she says, I know he will raise again in the end. No, he, she, she, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me shall not die, but he shall live forevermore. This right here, my friend, is not just talking about that. It is Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection includes the fact that you one day will, your, your, little, your, your dry bones, if you die before, should the Lord tarry, your dry bones will come out the grave. That's what the Bible says. You will, there will be a come to meeting in the air. There will be a camp meeting in the air one day. Hallelujah. But I got good news for you. Today, even right now, while you're living and walking with God, you can walk in resurrection life. I want you to know that. That's what it says. Even we also should walk in newness of life. And so I need you to understand that this is what God is seeing about the believer when he comes to Christ. The minute, when was the first day you got saved? You got to, you, I, we don't have time for everybody to share, but y'all, y'all brain should have been flooded right back to the first day. When you know that you got saved. On that day when you got saved, this is what God believed about you. In God's mind, he's like, oh, there he goes. Look, he, he's in Christ. Oh, look, there, there, I remember that day whenever my son died on the cross and he breathed out his last breath and he said, it is finished. I remember that. I remember when Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus went and took him down off the cross after acting, asking Pilate's permission, and they put him in the tomb. I remember that. Micah was in him. I could see it. Jace was in him. Matt was in him. Sabrina was in him. I could see it. Look, he could see the mind of the father that saw that event. He can flood backwards, and he can see that. So the day that you got saved, at that instant, in that, in that circumstance, right there in the mind of God, he saw you. In Christ, dying with Christ, being buried with Christ, hallelujah. And on the third day, hallelujah, just as Jesus resurrected from the dead, you too should walk in newness of life. Amen. That's the gospel. You got to understand it spiritually speaking, in the mind of God, the old man you were, born of Adam, dead in sin, died in Christ, and a new man has been resurrected. That's what it means to be born again. Born again. Amen. You was born the first time. You got to be born a second time. Amen. I hope that makes sense to you, some of that, right? Praise God. So it says, for if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Now, what I want you to understand here, it says planted together. I, I didn't really look at it today, but I can remember from studying this a long time ago that the word planted together there, it's one word in the Greek, and it's got a prefix, S-Y-N, like where you get synonym from, same. It's a, that prefix means the same or together. It's like the same thing. So the idea is, is that same, how you say that in Spanish? Well, get out of time. Mismo. Same, mismo, it's the same, it's the same. Whenever Jesus died and you by faith, you died with him, the same thing. God says he died, you died, okay? And, and so it's, it was done together, but look, I want you to see this. 
You, in the likeness of his death, you, became, you were the same with him in his death, but you shall also be the same in his resurrection. I added some little other things to the scripture to kind of make a point. This word right here, substitution, a lot of people have heard this concept before. You, you understand that Jesus was your substitute sacrifice. Have you ever heard, have you ever read anybody talk about that? Scholars talk about it. Commentators talk about it. Jesus was your substitute. Amen. Um, we definitely need some WD-40. Jesus was your substitute, amen? Because, you know why he was your substitute? Because, see, you can't die for your sin. Does it make sense, right? Because why? Because you have sin. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. So whenever man born, created of God without sin, sinned, and the entirety of the human race had sin, nobody was able to set free from sin. So God became man who had no sin and offered up his sinless life as payment of the penalty of sin. Amen. And so in that case, he's your substitute. But what we're talking about tonight has to do with identification. I want you to see that. Identification. That's a big concept that you and I need to understand. How do I identify? What is my new identity? Do you identify yourself with Christ in the light? Can you identify yourself in his death? Meaning, can you see the fact that you died with him? Amen. And can you identify yourself in his in the likeness of his resurrection? Meaning that you the old person you were died and a new man has resurrected. Amen. I don't know if this is going to work or if it's going to let me do it. But look. I just I was thinking about this. I didn't mean to do it in white, but here we go. Identity. Your new identity in Christ. Amen. So if we've been planted together with him in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Amen. This is your new identity. You need to be able to see yourself this way. Listen, whenever you're going through things and you got hate in your heart, I got something for you. Jesus don't hate nobody. So the old man and his behavior that hates folk, that's the old man. But you're a new man. And whenever you start to recognize those things in your life, you're supposed to come to the realization that is not of the Lord. That's my old man. I need the Lord to do resurrection life right there. Remove this death and put resurrection life. You can fill in the blank for whatever you want that to work for. Anything you want it to work for. If you got a problem with lust, if you got a problem with pornography, if you got a problem with addiction, if you got a if you got a problem with anger, if you got a problem with a sassy mouth, if you got a problem with a lying mouth, if you got a problem with a gossiping mouth, if you got a problem with whatever, 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 you can put that in the blank and you can understand that is not who I am. I got a new identity in Christ. The old has passed away, the new has come. Amen. Praise God. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, we should not serve sin. I, I, I did think that that was interesting. I wanted to point out that word destroyed a little bit. Let's see, what, what verse was that again? That was 6, verse Romans 6, 6. Because, you know, that word destroyed would say, if, if you're not careful, you may think, well, uh, I mean... If it's supposed to be destroyed, I mean, I know I'm saved, and I even understand the message of the cross kind of, sort of, so why I still find myself not being able to forgive? Why I still find myself? Well, first of all, the word destroyed there is not like what we would expect, because this is what the meanings are, but I really believe that the majority of this word is connected to this right here, to this idea right here, to render idle. You see that? To make it useless, Okay. That's where I believe we're, we're, we should be seeing this, that the proper relationship between the Christian and the, sin, and the power of sin should be that it lie, it's lying idle and that it's dormant and that it's not our master, but that Jesus is our master and that we can say no because of the grace of God flowing in our life and the fact that, that a miracle has taken place 
in our walk and in our life with the Lord. So I want you to understand this is very, this is very supernatural. So knowing this, that our all, do you know this? I want you, I want you, I want you to focus on know, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed. So I put this little thing. Who is the old man? Now, many of you already know that, but I mean, <coughs> we're not talking about aches and pains, sir. Uh, who is the old man? Amen. Um, yeah, it's, it's, it's the person you were born in Adam. Okay, that, I mean, that's, that's the perfect answer. Well, let's dig a little bit deeper. I'm just saying, because if we say, if we say it's Adam, then what's going to happen? If we're not careful, we might not see ourselves. So what does Adam look like in Matt? You know, I mean, I don't have to go through the whole, I don't think you need me to go through the whole list again. But what does Adam look like in you whenever Adam tries to come back alive? Y'all know your own self better than I do, right? The only person that knows you better than you know yourself is the Lord. Amen? Because you know your own thoughts, your own motives, your own all, the, all your dealings, you know how you used to be. You can tell. Can you not oftentimes tell when the old man's coming back alive? You can feel it. And, you know, let me just tell you this. When the old man comes back alive, there's usually not a lot of peace connected to that. That's how you, a lot of times you can tell whether it's chaos or anxiety and frustration, you know. Oh, there's that old man again. What I, and most of the time, you know, I feel like the Lord wants to get us to a place in our walk, though, where, where we can get that little quick glimmer, where the situation arises, the person, whoever they are, did what they did, and we're about to, we're about to go off. The old man's about to resurrect, and then all of a sudden the Lord just gives us a little glimmer. And it's like it all throttles down, and it's a work of the Spirit, and I didn't even do it. Don't you want to get to that place? Where, where, like, it's one thing to be in a place with God where when you mess up, you're like, you know what? I messed up. I mean, really, because that's still going to happen. I don't care how mature you are. I messed up, but look, the preacher said, or I read, you know, whatever, that I'm justified by faith. And that that's what God says about me, right? We talked about that before. The word righteous means right standing with God. The word justified means that God says that about me. And so I'm going to start to understand justification that, yes, even though I messed up, I asked forgiveness. God says of me that I'm forgiven, and i got to start believing that, and that will start to set you free. But isn't it be a beautiful thing if right before the, bat, the old man rises and the test is there? Because, you know, can you imagine, like, the story of Job? And it's like, here comes um, however you want to do the Satan thing. We're just going to leave it like that. Some of y'all don't even know what we're talking about, but that's okay. Like the, 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 um, the sons of God, fallen angels, along with the Satan, show up. And he says, where you been? Up and down, to and fro. The Bible tells us in Peter, 1 Peter 5, hey, be, be sober, be vigilant. Your adversary, the devil, roams around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. That's what he does, my friend. He walks around seeking whom he may devour. He's checking you out. He's checking me out. He's putting some little stuff up in his little notepad. And then he's coming back, giving an account to God. And he's saying, yeah, but what about this one? Yeah, but what about that one? And so what, I, what I'm trying to say is this, is that, is that in that particular story, Job amen, is having to deal with something. So he's having to deal with something. God's giving the enemy permission to go a certain, a certain, uh, giving him some leeway to go so far. And he says, you can go this far, but you can't go that far. And then the next time he says, you can go a little further, but you can't go past this. What I'm trying to tell you is, is that in your life, God is going to allow the devil some leeway because it's on God's end, it's a test. On the devil's end, it's a stumbling block to try to get you to mess up so that he can accuse you of being a failure. But God allows it to happen to test us, to put us to the test. Because, it, because the test allows us to grow. Because it shows us where the areas of our heart are that aren't right. It shows us areas of our heart where we need extra study or we need extra work. Work from the Lord to change us. And what a beautiful thing when you pass the test. Amen. The very thing today that got you mad, next week, you'd be like, no, not today, you lying devil. I can, oh, I see it now. 
And you get that little glimmer, and it's like, and, and, and you look to the Lord. And I'm telling you, what the beautiful thing is, is that you will notice it, because I've experienced it sometimes, where the very thing that got me mad last week, and I'm talking about so, you know, you understand that one of the lusts of the flesh is wrath, and that that is a demonic kind of anger. And you know how when anger is demonic, I'm going to tell you a secret. You can't control it. Oh, you already know you look like a fool. My wife would be the first one to tell you how many times have I been angry and looked the fool. And can't just like, well, are you going to stop? <laughs> can't, could you stop? Could you just, no, can't. Don't, you know what? Don't want to. I'm loving this right now. For some reason, my flesh loves this fit that I'm throwing. <laughs> right? I mean, think about it, how silly it is. But my, for sorry, it just feel, this is t- 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 tantalizing and tintillating. I love this flesh fit that I'm throwing right now. It just makes me feel so good. It makes me feel so strong, so powerful. I can scream, and I can make people do what I want them to do. I'm just, I'm going overboard. But I'm trying to make a point because y'all all know what I'm talking about. Y'all been there before. Right? And then it's like afterwards, man, like I ain't going to admit it to her. I mean, I'm, you know, I probably would. But I'm thinking, boy, look, dude, I look like a dummy right there. I'm glad I wasn't looking in the mirror. I would have looked like an absolute fool. You know? You get the point, though. Right? And, and I'm just trying to say that what I'm, the point that I'm trying to make with all of that, I know I added a lot of drama to it. But y'all, I wanted to make a reference point because I know y'all have been there before, at least one time in your life, where you got so angry. And it wasn't a righteous anger, and you could not stop it because it's demonic, and it had power over you in that situation. What I'm trying to tell you is I'm trying to flip the script for you to make you understand that when you begin to walk in the spirit of God, and this old man is trying to rise up, and the Lord flashes that thing across the screen of your mind, and he says, you don't have to do that. You don't have to give in to that because that's not who you are. You're a new man in Christ. And whenever you're able to yield to that voice of the Lord, dude, you feel it immediately. Click. The light switch is turned off. (sighs) Everything throttles down. It's like it's that fast. That's how that's what I'm trying to say. You will know the spirit of God moved in your heart in that instance. And you will begin to understand why it was able to work. And it has to do with the fact that the old man has been crucified and buried in Christ. And just as he died, we now can walk in newness of life. And now whenever we face these situations, guess what? We don't have to fall prey to it anymore. Amen. Praise God. This is what it says. This is what happened to the old man. Paul said this in Galatians 2, verse 20. He said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And therefore, the life which I now live in the flesh, meaning this physical life, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know, there's so much in this scripture. And I know I've shared this I want y'all to know I remember when I share things. It's not like I'm losing my, my mind. I mean, sometimes I know my memory gets bad, but for the most part. And I can remember, and I shared this not that long ago because I remember Shelby was in here when I said it. Whenever at the old church that I used to go to, okay, we had a, a, youth, we had a youth ministry. And I, I don't, I'm not going to talk negative because just it's not necessary. But they had a music ministry for the youth. And they were really talented. Like one year they won the whole, dude, this is a big thing in the Assemblies of God. I'm just telling you. We went to nationals, look, and I'm pretty sure it was the year Brad and I went, and they won the whole thing, dude. Like I'm talking about every Assembly of God church in the nation of the United States of America sending their youth ministries that have, that have music groups over there to compete. And Franklin, Louisiana won the whole shebang. All right. So they're anyway, they're up there and they're and they're and they're leading worship. It's a Sunday night, and Steve and Donna are are, are the youth ministers and they're about to leave. And and I can remember like it's so vivid. And they're playing music. They got the whole service. They're playing music. And and I went up to the I went up to the front and I was on my knees and I was praising, praising the Lord, thanking him for what he had done for me. And I could re- I could remember like it was yesterday. He said, Matt, I died. So that you could live. And now I need you to die so that I can live through you. Dude, that is so good. Isn't that good? I, I died so that you could live. My death brings life, but now I need you to die in me, daily dying. 
Amen. So that I can now live through you. Because guess what? If the old man of mad is still walking around here, getting a- demonically angry at the drop of a hat, doing the wrong thing all the time, saying the wrong thing all the time, saying it the wrong way, not caring if I hurt. Listen, I know we got a couple of bosses in here. I'm, I ain't talking to the bosses, but I am talking to the bosses just like I'm talking to the employees. Just because you're a boss or just because you're an employee and you got another job, you know, two weeks down the road, like, I'll put in my two-week notice, and I'll just act any way I want to to my boss. Dude, that's the most foolish thing I've ever heard in my life. You can't just walk around here acting like you want to act. Well, I'm the boss of this place. I, that, that employee about to hear what for. Well, guess what? You've also been telling them about Jesus. It also works with that, right, Rob? Not when, just whenever you go to Burger King can you, and she got your order wrong. Right, because he heard me the other day. He said it to me. I was so frustrated. I went to Smoothie King. But I didn't lose. I said, dude, look, I'm going to tell you all what I did. I said, bro, I ordered a large, and you gave me a medium. And I'm like, look, this is what I'm going to do, buddy. I'm going to drive back around, and I'm going to get my large. And the only reason I'm even making a big deal about it is because you verified it. You said a large. And I said, yes, sir, a large. And I said, look, I'm going to drive around. And you can, I'm, here's my card. Hold on to it. Charge me for this. And when I come back around, I'm going to get my large, okay? And, and look, dude, don't spit in my, my smoothie, man. <laughs> I did it. I'm so, I know. that was my flesh, right? Y'all can admit it. It's okay. Y'all can look at me funny. I didn't yell at him. I didn't cuss at him, but I was definitely sassy. All right. And so anyway, Rob says, well, can you tell him about your Jesus? Amen. But, and, and that's a good question. I, told, I saw him again today. I bought a smoothie, and I was like, hey, thank you, buddy. <laughs> I don't think he's like looking at me like, yeah, whatever, preacher. But anyway, the point being is this, is that guess what? It works all the time. Because when you come to the revelation and understanding that you were bought with a price and that your life is not your own, and you're an imager, if we learn in that in our little book, you're an imager or a representative of the Lord on the earth, you can't just live your life any old way you want to. You're, you're, you're representing Jesus. You done gave a mouthful to somebody about the Lord, and now you're acting like a fool. Lord, help us. Amen. And he will. He will help us. So I've been crucified. Matt, I died so you can live. Now I need you to die. I need your flesh to die. I need even your little sassy comments. You didn't have to tell that dude don't spit in my smoothie because he wasn't going to sp- probably spit in your smoothie. Or if he, or if he, now that you told him, he probably did. <laughs> and I probably deserved it. But anyway, the point being is this, is that you ain't got to like live like that old dude, bro. Right? You know, like how many mistakes have you made, Matt? You know, how many? T- anyway, you get the point. All right, so, and here's another scripture that talks about that, that you put off concerning the former conversation, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. I saw another young guy today in the clinic, and he had a WWJD bracelet on, and I started kind of messing with him a little bit, and uh, he actually goes to, uh, he goes to Brian Head's church, and so, and he loved the Lord, man, and, and so he made the comment, he actually quoted the scripture right here. And I was like, dude, that's so cool. That's in my message tonight. He said, yeah, man, do away with the old. Amen. And embrace, embrace the new, the old man, right? And so for this King James word right here, I, uh, I kind of wanted to make the point. I know I've made it before. Many of y'all know it. But that word conversation, it has to do really more. It has to do with your old life, your old lifestyle, the way that you used to live your life. Put off concerning your former lifestyle, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. So you, got to, you and I need to understand that the old man born like Adam was bound by sin. But what the scripture is saying is that when you and I get saved, that that old man is put to death in Christ. He's buried with Christ. And the new man is resurrected in Christ. And so now at some point in time, once we begin to understand this, <laughs> are you ever grateful that you've been exposed to this type of teaching, you know, that helps you to understand that to walk with God, that, that the old that you were, because you, you remember whenever you were a Christian and you didn't know these things? So you and I should be ever grateful, right, for the word, amen, that we've been exposed to these truths, because, because now by the grace of God, we can put off the old lifestyle, we can put off the old man, we can put off our old behavior, our responses. You know, look, I, I say it all the time. Why I don't know why those anger fits would make us feel so good, and I don't know why gossiping feels so good. 
But I'm just being honest with you. I've been, I've had problems with gossiping in my life. I thank God that for the most part I think I'm done. But every now and then I catch myself, I'm like, Lord, Jesus, help me. Right? One of the things that first started happening to me whenever I started understanding the message of the cross, it was the most amazing thing. And I challenge you to do this. Dude, you talk about this is good stuff. And you don't have to do it in a prideful way because I was being genuine when I did it. Every single time I would catch myself, it sounded like or I was talking with somebody else. And it sounded like we were getting ready to start gossip. I'm like, dude, we need to pray for that person. Let's pray right now. And we'd start praying. And I mean, and I meant it because the Lord was leading and guiding me that way. And you do, you talk about de throttle the devil. You talk, he's just like over there with his pants down. If you're even allowed to say that from behind the pulpit, he don't even know what to do with himself. He's just all embarrassed of himself. His, his little scheme didn't work. Oh, dirty devil, you know, he's like, he, you're exposed. You tried to get me to gossip, but I ain't gossiping. I'm about to lift that brother up. I'm going to lift that sister up in the Lord. Amen. I'm going to do it the Lord's way. I'm going to do it the new way. The new man is alive and walking in resurrection power. And look, the Lord, and listen, you know what the beauty of that is? You're not, this isn't why you're doing it. You're doing it because your heart's being changed, right? And you're starting to look more like the Lord. But you know what the beauty is in that? You just open yourself up from a for a blessing. <laughs> you understand? I know you're not doing it for that, or at least you're not supposed to be doing it for that. But when you did it, you just opened yourself up for a blessing because we think the Lord's saying, now nah, you're getting it. Now I can trust that servant. I can pour out the, the blessing on that brother, on that sister, because look what they're doing. They're acting like my son Jesus. Even though people are despitefully using them, even though people are treating them wrong, instead of gossiping, they're praying. And they're asking me to minister. And listen, i got to tell you this too, where it says, Praying for them people so that the Lord will heap coals of fire on their head. I can tell you right now, you are not supposed to want God to heap coals of fire on somebody's head. It's just not, it can't be right. Come on. If Jesus saved you, you know he wants to save them. So what I'm trying to say is that you can't be praying like that. Lord, Lord, come on. You, you, are, you are my vengeance, says your, says your word. Heap of coals of fire upon their head. No. But if you, the old man that you were, that would have wanted that, can humble himself and truly from a heart of love and compassion say, God, please minister to that person and Lord, please help heal my heart. Man, look, he might, he very well might. If, if that person keeps messing with you, they're going to end up with some hot coals on their head. Okay, because that, but God's going to do it his way. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. And at the same time, you will receive a blessing from God. Amen. I, I, I don't know how much more clearly I can how I can say that. But um, so look, in Ephesians 4, 23 and 24, he says, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. So I want you to see that right there. Look at this. Renewed, the renewed mind. You know, I used to go to a church a long time ago, and I was there for about 13 years. And I don't think that this preacher was doing this on purpose. I really don't. I think it was just something he picked up from somebody else that he learned from maybe or whatever. But it was a big deal for me. Cause I, so he used to say, it, like, he used to say, renew your mind by the washing of the water of the word. Well, both of those scriptures come from Ephesians, but they're in two completely different chapters. And the way it was being, the way it was being taught was that that's how you renew your mind. You wash it by reading the word. Now, let me just back up a second because I want to make a point. If you're reading the word in its right context that through the years, you are kind of like giving your brain a really good washing. Okay, but at the same time, it's not you're making your brain clean and renewing your, your mind just because you read a chapter today. Because as a matter of fact, if you read a chapter today with the wrong motives, thinking that you're making yourself more holy, now you've turned it into a work of the flesh. And instead of helping you, it's only going to hurt you. So, but, the, but, but what I have come to realize is that the renewed mind, the renewed in the spirit of the mind, understands that he's a new man in Christ. That's powerful, dude. Because, see, now you're reordering your life this way. And, and as you're walking the journey of life, you're realizing, nope, that's old man behavior right there. I don't really do, I don't do that anymore. 
This, oh, this, is a new, this is the new way God would have me to do it. So whenever I talk to you sometimes about Proverbs, and I, say, I talk about how Proverbs says knowledge, wisdom, and understanding. Y'all heard me talk about that before? Because to me it's a, it's a major concept that knowledge, the knowledge of God is even putting the word of God in you. You remember how, long, how far away you used to be as a Christian? Like, in other words, in your understanding of the Bible, you didn't know, I mean, when you first got saved, you didn't really know much, right? I mean, can we all agree with that? You shake your head, yeah. We didn't know hardly nothing. So then we start putting the Word of God in there, and then, like, something simple, a soft answer turns away wrath. I used to just read my proverb, one proverb a day, man. If I do that, I get through Proverbs every month, and that used to be the only Bible reading I did. And if that's all you do, praise God, you're doing something, all right? Whenever, so when I would, I would read it, and it's like a soft answer turns away wrath. And then I read another one, and it said, even a fool is perceived as wise when he shuts his lips. Oh, man. And then the first time that an opportunity arises, I can remember one time, I way to probably remember this story. I, went, I was selling a roof. And this guy got a whole, it was a long story. He got a whole bunch of money back on his deal. He's like, well, this is the deal, Matt. You are going to give me back $4,000 so I can buy me some new gutters. And I said, no, sir. I'm not, I don't, first of all, I don't have the authority to do that. Number two, that's not the deal that we signed up. That's not going to happen. But, and I don't remember exactly what all was. So then we were talking about some numbers and stuff, and they started getting really, really agitated and frustrated. And all of a sudden, I could feel the Holy Spirit. And I, and I can remember I said this. I said, I said, I said ma'am, sir, I am so sorry. I think something's wrong. I think that I'm having a hard time saying my words right. I don't think I'm properly explaining myself. It's my fault. Let, let's try this again, and let me try to see if I can help you understand. Dude, it changed the whole atmosphere. I'm telling you, like just by me trying to humble myself, and it wasn't me. They, they're like, well, we got college educations, and we, we don't understand a word of what you're saying. It ain't really hard math. The problem is that you don't want to understand it because that means that that money's coming to us, and it, cause it don't belong to you. But, but, I, but if I had said that, it would have got even worse. And so whenever I took the lick and I humbled myself and I said, look, let's try this again. The whole atmosphere changed. And I walked out of there with the check, did not give in. Then I turned around and talked to the boss, and I said, hey, look. Is there any way we can help these people? And Wade said, well, we can do this for them. And when I came back then, they was just ecstatic all over again. because but, but I wasn't giving in right then because it wasn't what was right. And I didn't have the authority to do that. What is my point? Not all that. My point is a soft answer turns away wrath. And even a fool is considered wise, amen, whenever he shuts his lips. And so with all that said, the renewed mind understands that he's a new man and he starts to perceive the world around him from the eyes of a new man, from the brain of a new man, from the tongue of a new man. Amen. And he begins to respond to those situations differently. Knowledge, the application of knowledge is wisdom. And then once wisdom, once you really start working with wisdom, what, see, I feel like the Bible is another language. I've told y'all that before. And I've prayed before. I've prayed, God, I want to be fluent in your word. I want to be fluent in the language of the Bible. That means that I can, that I understand. It, it, listen, if you're going to be fluent in a language, you got to know more than just being able to throw a little word out there every now and then. You got to know how to construct sentences. You got to know how to do grammar. You got to understand, if you're going to speak Spanish or write Spanish, you got to understand that their question mark is upside down. You got to know all of these little details. And when, if you're going to be fluent in the word of God, then you're going to have to understand some things that you're going to have to be more than just being able to quote a scripture. You're going to have to understand what that scripture means. And then as you begin to put that knowledge in you, and then God allows those opportunities of testing to come. Here comes, here comes the sons of God along with the Satan. And they're trying to, oh, but look at your servant. Look at my servant, Matt. Yeah, well, you go ahead and move your hand from him for one split second and see what he does. And then the Lord allows, hopefully not as bad as Job, 
but he allows a little situation in your life to put the test to you. Hallelujah. Knowledge, wisdom means application. Oh, I've already been through that one last year at those people's house, and I learned that a soft answer turns away wrath. Let me throttle this thing down. Let me use the proverb right here. Boom, there it happens again. The Lord's in the midst of it. You're finally learning something, my son. I'm so proud of you, my daughter. You've been putting the word of God in you, and now you're submitting to the word and allowing my word to work in real live life. Amen? So the renewed mind understands he's a new man in Christ. That's what I need you to know. Now, how are you going to learn what the, new, what the new man looks like? Reading the Bible. But does that not make sense what I just said? I just, I just did a flip-flop on you. But it, you understand it's all about motives? Like, in other words, when I used to read my Bible because that preacher was saying, renew your mind by the washing of the water of the word, I would literally go home and say, I'm going to read not three chapters because I need some real washing. I'm going to read four chapters. And then when I only read 2.5 chapters, I felt condemned and guilty because I didn't achieve what I promised God I was going to achieve. And the whole thing's a big old mess. Because that's not really what it is. But when you go back to the word of God and you're like, you know what, Lord, I believe your word is truth. Your word is life. And I believe if I put your word on the inside of me, mixed with your Holy Spirit, there's going to be some good knowledge and wisdom is going to come out of this. And pretty soon, I'm going to be able to see things on this earth that other people can't see. Because I got you in my corner. Hey, dude, do you realize how beautiful that is? You got God on your side, my friend. The God of glory. I mean, think about that. I know y'all believe it, but we don't stop and think about it enough. The God that scattered the stars in the sky, breathed life into that lump of clay that he named Adam, lives inside of you. <laughs> you got the power of God at your disposal. Amen? That's good stuff right there. Praise God. All right. So we talked about the renewed mind. I'm, I'm actually going to be closing pretty soon. But look, Romans 6, 7 says this. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Now I want you to see this verse right here. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So I want you to see that word reckon right there. That word reckon, I mean, I know that they used to say back in the old days in the old, old King James, or like if you met a country boy from Shreveport, he'd probably say, well, I reckon it's so. But that's not really what that, that word means. He, but let me just tell you what, what I feel like the Lord showed me about this. God wants you and I to be able to, to, to believe or to perceive or to see what he sees about you. You see that? Look, he that is dead is free from sin. That's what God says about you. That's what Romans 6 says about you. Yes, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul penned it. The Holy Spirit wanted believers of all ages to know that true faith in Christ leads to the old man dying in Christ, being buried in Christ, a new man resurrected, and he that is dead is freed from sin. So God says, no, you're dead. This is what I think. This is, God would say to you and I tonight, he would say, I believe your old man is dead. Well, how do you believe that, Father? Because I, I deemed it so. Because I wrote it before the foundation of the earth. For you were not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold, but instead by the precious blood of a lamb that was foreordained before the foundation of the earth. Gee, I already knew man was going to fall when I created him. I already knew it, but I already had a plan in place to redeem him. Hallelujah. And now I'm trying to tell you another level to it. That what I see when you get saved is that the old man born of Adam dies with Jesus, and he's buried with him, and a new man is resurrected, and guess what? He that is dead is free from sin. That's what I say. That's what my word says. That's what my faithful servant, Paul, the apostle Paul, said, and if you will believe it, see, for you to believe it, you're going to have to start to reckon it. You're going to have to start to be able to believe what God believes about you. God believes if you're a true Christian tonight, that the old man died and a new man has been resurrected. So that has to do with the renewed mind. Reckoning and the renewed mind. Amen? That as I begin to reorder my life, I understand I'm not that person anymore. I'm a new creation. So let's close this up. Review, conclusion, whatever you want to call it. Did you not know? 
Amen. Did you not know, and also that you and I died, we, di- we, we died in his likeness, and we resurrected in his likeness, and that death concept has to do with substitution. He was our substitute sacrifice because he was the one that was without sin, and you and I were all guilty, but hallelujah, God sent the sinless one to die for us, but what we really need to be reminded of also is our identification in him. We need to start to see our new identity that we died with Christ and that we've been buried with him and that we're a new creation and we don't have to respond the old way and by the grace of God, we can begin to respond the new way. Praise God. Hallelujah. I know that there's a lot, a lot of people that are better at this than I am. What I mean is, um, well, this too, but what I mean is responding the right way. Have you, haven't you seen some Christians before that are like, man, I wish I could, I wish I could be more soft-spoken, or I wish I could respond. That, I don't know about you, but I, I, I just want to be, I want to, I want to be able to let God have his way in these areas. Because listen, you talk about bring power to your witness. You know what I'm saying? Bring power to your witness. Can you imagine a situation, could you imagine a situation where you're in a circumstance with your family, maybe? I'm not talking about your children that love you and put up with you, but I'm talking about your sister or your brother or your whatever. Okay, and they just looking for, they just look, like Brad used to say, it's gross, but they looking for a booger in your biscuit. They know you got problems, and they trying to call you out, and they just can't wait till they find that little thing that's in your, that's in your little world, and they're going to point it out, and they're going to clown you about it. But could you not imagine, and whenever they, and they know how to press your button, and, and when they press your button, they're like, hmm, they got that little smirk on their face, like, mm-hmm, I knew that was still in there. Could you imagine the day that they're trying to do all that, and by the grace of God, that little glimmer gr- runs across the front of your screen, and the Lord says, you don't have to respond that way, and everything throttles down, and you genuinely, you can't do it. Like, I done seen people, I, I done even seen, I seen people in the church, and they, and it, they faking it. They faking it. Like, like, in other words, they're able to control their emotions, but it's not really the spirit of God that's doing it. And the way they respond is, is that they, they put on that little fake face like, now you know, you're not supposed to try to do that to me. I'm, I'm overemphasizing it, but you understand what I'm saying. Have you ever noticed somebody do that before where you're about to get in an argument with that person? Or let's say you're the one that's, you kind of like frustrated with somebody and y'all, and y'all about to get into something like a little mix of words, okay? And, and y'all both Christians. And you over here about to give them a what for because they probably kind of halfway deserve it. And you're about to give it to them. And then what, then what ends up happening is, is that then they turn around and they like, now look at you, you... Boy, aren't you just the Christian? And, and you know that they fit. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about a genuine response of love that understands, and not, not hypocritical either, not self-righteous, but a genuine response of love that understands, because you ought to be able to see yourself in that person because you yourself have been that way. And had it not been for the Lord delivering you, you'd still be right there. You'd still be the one acting like that. You'd still be the one being condescending, right? But, but instead, on that day, whenever that mess is about to go down and that person's acting that way and, and the Lord throttles it down in you, you don't respond like the old man. You don't get angry. They, they press your button. They're over there. Pop, 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 pop. Well, I'm not getting this response. And they start pressing it even harder. And, you just, and you're able to respond with genuine love from the Lord. Amen? Whether it's humbling myself. Is it that big of a deal to say I'm sorry? I'm just saying if you mean it, because don't waste your words if you don't mean it. But is it that big of a deal to take the fault? (laughs) Wow, what a novel thought. Well, I ain't the one that did it. Well, guess what, my friend? Either is Jesus. (laughs) He ain't the one that did it. But what did he do? He took it for you. He took it for me. And so in some kind of way, whenever we humble ourselves and we actually take the fault, oh, but if I do that, if I take the fault, then they're going to think they're right. Who cares what they think? I'm just trying to say, I'm trying to teach you something that I've experienced in my life, that, that if I respond with humility like that, and I do, and I'm able to respond like that, like all I know is, is that I feel like God's happy with me. And I don't care what that, per- I mean, I can, you know, I can. So, so you're able to respond in that way with genuine love. 
Can you not imagine how much that's going to disarm the devil, how it's going to disarm that person? And then you really do love that person anyway, right, because we're talking about a family member. And then you're driving down the road, and this is your prayer on the way home. Now, just imagine it. It's going to happen. Look, it's going to happen because all that other stuff doesn't happen to you. So now we're going to call this forth. Let's speak it into existence. It's a good confession right here. So you're driving down the road now, and you're like, Lord, thank you. Thank you for giving me the strength and the grace that I needed to respond that way because I believe by your grace I passed this test. And now, Lord, I lift, that, I lift up my brother, my sister, my friend, and I pray that you would minister to them. And I pray that you would lead them and guide them to truth. And I pray that you would help me to continue to be a better witness in their life. Dude, you think if you don't pray that prayer and after all that happened that the Lord's not going to mess with them? And, and, and kind of get them to toss and turn a little bit? <laughs> kind of get them to think? Amen? I'm telling you, it will. All right, so the likeness of his death, we begin to identify ourselves not only in his death but also in his resurrection. And who is that old man? We know it's Adam. But, look, it's not only just Adam, right? It's Adam. It's our first birth. But it's all for us as individuals. It's all that stuff from our old life that keeps trying to creep up. But I'm crucified with Christ. And, but I'm alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. I'm re, I have a renewed mind by the grace of God as I put the word of God in me in its proper context. I begin to understand I, I have a renewed mind and that I need to start to reckon myself indeed to sin. That's what the new man believes. That's what the new man with a new mind believes. I begin to see myself the way God sees me. The way God sees me is that my old man. Amen. Shelby, why don't y'all come up here and play us a song? I know it's late. I know you mamas. Hey, does school start yet? When does school start? Next week? Yeah. This Friday? Okay, I know. But anyway, we're coming up on it. I'm going to have to, by the grace of God, I'm going to have to try to be more mindful for all these mamas and daddies that got to send their kids to, to school. Amen. But, but hey. You send your kids to school with a little bit of the of grace, of, the grace of God working in your life. Amen. Be, and then now just think about that. I didn't even get into that. Like now you responded in the in the spirit, and your kid was able to experience you responding in the spirit. And so now your kid actually the morning of the first day of school is going to school with a joyful heart. Amen. Isn't that a beautiful world we live in? And that's not the Truman Show, my friend. That's really. Living with the Lord. Amen. Praise God. Let's go out of his house worshiping him. Amen.